this book has an interesting story because it really is uh, originally my first foray into writing. In 1985, I was finishing my master's thesis in Washington, D.C. at Oblate College next to Catholic University. And Bishop Walter Posca at that time was our rector of the seminary, and he said, why don't you write about Metropolitan Sheptitsky and how he helped establish the Ukrainian Catholic Church in the United States? So I did this on a typewriter, and it was sitting, uh, I'll put this book down, it was sitting in my room on my shelf as a master's thesis, only text. In Ukraine, when I was visiting for various work, I noticed how inexpensive it was to publish. And I noticed that they didn't have a lot of work about how Sheptitsky helped in the United States. So I had this book translated into Ukrainian. Remember, it's just a master's thesis. I added some pictures, and it was published in Ukraine. That was my first book. Flash forward a few years, like like seven or eight, and I'm thinking, geez, I have a lot more information about Sheptitsky plus so many new pictures, and it's never been published in English. And there still isn't a book in English about Sheptitsky's work with our church. So... I was assigned up here in the mountains of Krahunksen, New York. My trustee, uh, Alex Stetsik, one of my good trustees, is a graphic artist. And he said, I'll help you do the graphic arts work on Sheptitsky. So I published this book, the original this, uh, master's thesis, plus I added about 100 pages of original documents translated into English. So this book actually ended up with approximately 31 documents, some of which had never been translated into English. So the full title of the book is Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky and the Establishment of the Ukrainian Catholic Church in the United States. I couldn't find a longer title, so I had that one. And this picture is actually Metropolitan Sheptitsky in Philadelphia. But the book stops at about 1924. One of the difficult things about the Ukrainian Catholics in America is the fact that the Latin Catholics, the Latin Catholics said that Ukrainian Catholics are here temporarily. They don't need a structure. Why don't they just go to the Latin Catholic Church, and should they ever return back to the old country, they can go back to theirs. The idea in Catholicism of having one bishop per territory is a very ancient one. Now, in Halachina, we had actually three bishops in Yavil. We we had uh, the Roman Catholic or Latin Catholic, the Ukrainian Catholic, Sheptitsky, and then there was the Armenian Catholic. So you had three, three, three Catholics, bishops in the same territory, but not in the United States. So... Their way of looking at Catholicism was, the Latin Catholic way is, we have u- unity of jurisdiction, one bishop, one territory, and uniformity of discipline. In other words, everyone has the same holy days, the same canon law, uh, the same structure. All of a sudden, the Ukrainians come, and as I mentioned before in one of my interviews, Lent, there's no Ash Wednesday. We begin Lent on a Monday. Biggest, biggest thing is our priests are married. No, no uniformity of discipline. So Sheptisky is the one who helped overcome this also by his personal friendship with St. Pope Pius X, who was bishop after Leo, uh, Pope after Leo the Thirteenth in 1903 till 1914. He's the one that had First Holy Communion as a practice developed but he was a personal friend of Sheptitsky. And Sheptitsky said, our people are being lost to the faith. Now, with every good intention, I'm sure, the Russian Orthodox, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, all the Protestant sects saw that our people were without pastors. And they were trying, once again, I think with the best of intentions, to convert them to their faith. So Sheptitsky said, without the priests, without bishops, without that structure, the church is without discipline. 
and they don't always go to the Roman Catholic Church. At that time, the liturgy, the Mass, was in Latin. They were not used to it. The host was a wafer. We have leavened bread. So for a lot of reasons, Sheptisky uses influence and power to get a bishop and to structure our church. And he came here twice, 1910, also went to Montreal with Ortinsky. So Bishop Ortinsky and Sheptisky went to the Congress in September of 1910, the Eucharistic Congress in Montreal. And there are pictures in the archives in Montreal of Sheptisky and Ortinsky in the various processions of the Eucharistic Congress. Sheptisky came again in 1921-22, both to Canada, the United States, South America, to raise money for orphans. So he was very involved in the church here. And as poor as the situation was in various times in history, I would say, without Sheptisky's influence, the Ukrainian Catholic Church in the United States definitely would not exist. I tell my parishioners, one of my favorite phrases of Jesus is, be clever as a serpent, but gentle as a dove. In other words, don't do anything illegal or immoral, but be clever. Be clever. Don't let yourself be pushed around. In marriages, there is politics, right? Mama Kaja, hey, don't tell Tata this right away. I'll pick a nice time to tell him so he doesn't get upset. Children says, oh, I'm not going to go to Tata, but Mama's going to give me this. How, would, how unusual a church would be if there would be no politics? We wouldn't be human. Of course we're human. Remember the apostles when Jesus was about to die? The mother of one of the, two of the apostles says, can my son sit at your right hand and your left hand? Politics. Of course there's politics. You want to make sure that Sheptitsky used politics morally and ethically to help the people be taken care of. So he didn't do things wrong, but he used his talent for languages. He spoke English, he spoke French, he spoke Ukrainian, German. He knew how to convey the needs of his people and use the tools that God gave him, not for personal advantage, but to help the people that he was called to serve, many of whom immigrated to this North American continent. As a church historian, what I think that secular historians sometimes underestimate is the power of principle, of a person who acts ethically, not because of pure politics or financial gain, but for the principle of helping human beings live better. And Sheptisky, I think, is unappreciated, as he was in his own time. If you look as a history, the bishops before him in Halachina, Sembratovich became a cardinal. Then there was Saskuyoloski just for a few months. Sheptisky was metropolitan for 44 years, never became a cardinal. After him, Patriarch Stipe became a cardinal. Lyubachevsky became a cardinal. Huzar became a cardinal. Probably Sviatoslav Shevchuk will become a cardinal. Why did they take this great man and never make him a cardinal? There was one Austrian uh, delegate who said, he is an idealist. If we make him a cardinal, because Austria had influence in Rome, then we will not be able to control him. They were worried not that he would use it for power, but he would really help people, and being a cardinal would give him authority. Sheptitsky is one of the most ethical persons I have studied as a historian. A millionaire who took his money and used it to help other people and died as a poor monk in Lviv while he was helping save people from the Nazi and the Soviet onslaughts during time of war while being bedridden, while being bedridden and paralyzed. That's a great man. That's a great man who loved people that he served, whether they were part of his flock or not, but as human beings. There are several biographies. I don't know if they're definitive, but 
Cyril Kotelevsky wrote one in French. It was translated to English by Serge Kelleher. Uh, Father Chilsky wrote, wrote a biography on the sociology, the theology. Father Peter Galadza wrote it about the liturgical activities of Sheptitsky. All of those have an amount of his work. I think in English, we're still waiting for, I think, perhaps even a two-volume biography of Sheptitsky. There's a lot to write about this great man. I think what attracted me, because it didn't start out as an attraction originally. Originally, I asked, uh, at that time, Monsignor Walter Pasco, who became an auxiliary bishop in Philadelphia, says, what should I write on? He was one of my teachers of canon law and my rector of the seminary. Once I got into it, remember, this is the age of electric typewriters. I went to the local libraries. Uh, what our spiritual director at that time was Father Pekar Bazilian, who had just come back from a conference in Toronto organized by uh, Professor Magocci about Sheptitsky. And he brought back some of the notes that he received at that, and he helped me tremendously. And what got me understanding a lot is that here's a man, Sheptitsky, who was baptized in the Roman Catholic Church as a Latin Catholic, Raised in the Polish sphere of influence, his father was a Ukrainian who had become Polonized. He ha he's about six foot seven, eight, give or take an inch or two. He's a count, a hraf, in the Austrian army. He's, he's a millionaire. He's got the world in front of him. He sees portrait of Ukrainian bishops and goes, why are these Ukrainian bishops here? You know, we're Polish. He goes, well, these are our ancestors. Athanasi Sheptitsky helped build St. George's Cathedral in Lviv. And he goes, I feel God is calling me to serve our people. He becomes a Ukrainian Catholic Brazilian monk. Now remember, six foot seven, six foot eight, small, smart, tall, dark, and handsome, the world in front of him, and he chooses to serve. That, th that decision... It's very easy to serve after you've lost everything. But like the saying in The Sound of Music says, you come to the monastery not because you've lost something, but because you have found someone. And that idealism that Halichanis scoffed at, that the Polish population thought betrayed by, that the Ukraine suspected, or he's just trying to ruin our church, that decision as a young man, it was a phenomenal decision of faith that he stayed with till he died. That is enthralling. Because so people have given themselves to a lot of other empty endeavors, like amassing a lot of toys or money or power of influence. Uh, but there's an old Protestant preacher who says, it is not foolish to give, you, give everything for something that can never be taken from you, as opposed to give something that cannot be taken from you for things that you will have to leave anyway. But that's a tough thing when, you, when you're in the game. It's easy to say post factum, after the fact. So that intrigued me about Shepitsky. The man that could have had everything in his society the best says, I want to be a Brazilian, Ukrainian, Catholic monk and give up everything wow that's phenomenal that's phenomenal it's hard to say that he did it for political power he did it because he loved christ he loved his fellow man and he thought this is the way god was asking him to live and not only did he think that he actually lived that way for his entire life you know, in Ukraine, there's a saying, Chesne zhitya nikhto ne perekonaya. It's a virtuous life. It's end. Don't say it can't be done if someone did it. Just say, I don't want to do it, and be honest about it. But this is a man who did it. That that intrigues me. And I see him in different stages of in life. You know, you look at pictures, you go, who was this man? He did this. He helped these people. He helped the Jews. He helped the Russians. He helped the Orthodox. He helped the atheists. He helped his fellow human beings. 
You know, people like to say we're all part of one human family. But when it gets tough, it's easy to break it up into groups and say, oh, those Catholics are not, those Orthodox are not. No, no. If it's one human family, then it's your brother or your sister that's having a problem. And your job is to help them, not to criticize them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is Baham.